I have the K-State logo. My name is Tom Vons, and I'm a professor at Kansas State University. And my other judges are? Tom, you're muted. My name is Tom Tinder, and I'm an attorney from Charleston, West Virginia. I'm Tom I'm Tinder, an attorney from Charleston, West Virginia. And I'm Steve Franzik, retired professor of political science from the U.S. Naval Academy. That's who we are. And now, who are you? Um, hi, we are Unit 6, representing the state of Illinois. Our coaches, as you know, are Kevin C. Hansen and Andrew Trankel. My name is Aaron McManus, and my colleagues are... Tommy Doubleday. Megan Quigley. And Luigi Laudando. Well, fantastic. We're here for Unit 6. I'm going to read the question. We're going to have a great, like, 15 minutes of high-level discussion about Unit 6 stuff, and then we're going to give you a little feedback, and then we'll go into some breakout room. We don't even know how all of this is working, to be honest with you, uh, on our end, but it seems to be working well. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, never in the history of this nation have so many people been arrested for the cause of freedom and human dignity. What lessons can be learned from the Children's March in Birmingham, Alabama? What is civic engagement and what is its significance in American history? What responsibility, if any, do schools have to promote civic engagement? You may begin when you are ready. American historian Howard Zinn once said, protest beyond the law is not a departure from democracy, it absolutely essential to it. In May of 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led thousands of children in a peaceful protest to fight against segregation and was subsequently met with brutal retaliation. This demonstration was monumental and has provided many lessons we can learn from today. It exemplified the importance of youth civic engagement and demonstrated how the right location and audience are critical to these movements. Moreover, it displayed ideas about civil disobedience that are utilized in protests today. Birmingham, Alabama became the ultimate battleground for civil rights in the mid 20th century during Martin Luther King's Birmingham campaign. After several peaceful protests ended in bloodshed and volunteers began to dwindle, leaders such as James Bevel proposed an all-student protest. In the spring of 1963, thousands of kids gathered to lead protests at Birmingham City Hall and were violently subdued by Birmingham police. Afterwards, the march succeeded in gaining significant media attention for civil rights. However, King received both criticism and praise for allowing children to participate in the protest. Surprisingly, civil rights <coughs> activist Malcolm X was one of the most vocal critics of King, saying that real men don't put their children on the firing line. In defense, King claimed that the march allowed children to develop a sense of their own stake in freedom and justice. Moreover, the march demonstrated the importance of civil disobedience and the necessity of involving everyone in a society when fighting against injustice. Those who participated in the march utilized their First Amendment rights, which state that Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The Children's March was effective, and not only that it gave students the opportunity to learn about their rights, but also employ them as citizens. Today, students can learn from the bravery of those who participate in the march, as younger generations are becoming increasingly more involved in political demonstrations and online campaigns. From climate change protests influenced by Greta Thunberg, to the March of Our Lives movement after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas school shooting, understanding the significance of the movements that came before ours will improve similar protests today. One of the largest successes of the Children's March was the immediate attention it acquired demonstrating another lesson we can learn, the necessity of having the right time and place to make a true impact. In the months leading up to the Children's March, King was leading failing protests in Albany, Georgia. Thousands of protesters were arrested without much of a stir and the momentum for the movement began to fade. Fortunately, similar plans were resurrected for the Children's March and the outcomes were exponentially different due to the different locations and demographics. Ultimately, the Birmingham campaign drew the world's attention to racial inequality in the South forcing desegregation in Birmingham and directly paving the way for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Civic engagement is the involvement of individuals or groups in society that advocate for change. This is the fundamental factor for change throughout our history. From the revolutionary era to the fight for LGBTQ rights today, people have led for change through advocacy and nonviolent protests throughout our history. 
without an engaged public, our country will struggle to develop in order to reflect the will of the people. Today, we believe civic participation begins in schools. Our education system should prioritize giving students the knowledge and skills necessary for an active and engaged citizenship. Moreover, it is crucial that schools also provide environments where students can demonstrate their civic knowledge. For example, schools need to allow students to have a voice in administrative decisions that affect them. The Children's March in Birmingham forever changed how we view civic engagement and not only demonstrated the importance of youth involvement, but the necessity of all groups in society, regardless of age, to participate and advocate for themselves in our democracy. As Abraham Lincoln once said, to sin by silence when they should protest makes cowards of men. Thank you. We are now open for questions. Thank you for that uh, excellent opening statement. We do have some follow-up questions. Yes, and what ways does the Constitution promote and or try, try to uh, thwart civic engagement? Well, our entire Constitution is essentially an outline to provide citizens with rights to engage with their government. Our Constitution, namely in the First Amendment, when we're given the rights to free speech, the right to petition, and the right to assemble, we're given the rights to have an open relationship with our government. We're allowed to legally criticize and legally advocate for change at the people that they want. And our framers did that very intentionally as a result of a lot of the grievances that they experienced under the rule of the British. And over however, time, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, however, it does seem that our constitution has stopped direct public engagement with things like um, the electoral college and the way that our senators were elected. So in that way, it is thwarting civic engagement. And we see over time that the Constitution adds amendments to build on and help facilitate uh, civic engagement. We see the 15th Amendment allowing former slaves to vote. We see the 19th Amendment and for women. And plus, we see 18 to 21 year olds being able to vote. And as my colleague Megan said, the direct election of senators that we didn't have in the beginning of this country's history. Any other, <clears throat> any other limits on civic engagement? Well, I mean, there are a lot of different forms of civic engagement, or some are a lot more effective than others. For instance, like my colleagues mentioned, we don't necessarily have a direct democracy, so sometimes it can be really hard for part people to participate on a national level. I'm sure a lot of people have opinions of what's happening on the national level, but not everyone knows how to find those outlets and how to communicate for them, because not everyone has the resources to go out and run for office. You could say running to be a politician in the House of Representatives or running to be a senator is one of the highest possible forms of civic engagement, but very, very, very few people have the money that it takes to have a campaign and have those things. So I would say the ability to run for office is one of the greatest limitations, because then we would like to think that any American, if they have the willpower, they would be able to run and win. That's just not necessarily the case, just given societal changes and societal pressures, money is one of the largest factor in campaigns, and that is hindering a lot of people's potential civic engagement. Let's let's turn our attention to civil disobedience. You mentioned that in your opening statement. <clears throat> is civil disobedience always an appropriate option of civic engagement? Well, as Martin Luther King Jr. said in a letter from um, Birmingham Jail, uh, we do have a moral responsibility to protest unjust laws. Um, and it does seem like those options are best during a protest as seen in the civil rights movement with things like the Montgomery bus boycott and um, various marches. Um, right, as, it, no, speak to um, as citizens of the United States, we are given the power, as my colleague mentioned, to ultimately either replace our government or advocate for new laws that will affect us. So ultimately, civil disobedience is beneficial pretty much on, on all stances and on all different issues because we are able to protest our rights or protest laws that affect us and ultimately argue for rights that would benefit and laws that would benefit us. So if you wanted to change the speed limit that was uh, in front of the school, uh, it would be appropriate to your first move would be to, to uh, violate a law in some way to cast light on that? Uh, in that specific scenario, it would not be appropriate. Uh, Why not? Because uh, I would say that you can see in the civil rights movement, that was a law that was oppressing African Americans. You can see the speed limit isn't exactly oppressing your right to drive your car. I would say that the best avenue to, for that grievance would be talk to your local city council or your county commissioner to see, to and outline why that road should have a higher or lower speed limit. And if you so, 
Go ahead, Aaron. If we look back to the roots of civil disobedience, starting with Henry David Thoreau, where he first started withholding his taxes because he wasn't supporting a war that the United States was involved in, he made his view of the war very clear before he started committing a crime, which was withholding taxes and refusing to pay. And I think because in your qu original question, is civil disobedience always good? It's not always good. It shouldn't necessarily always be your first choice. For instance, the example you named was perfect. You shouldn't just go 45 in a school zone while children are present just because you don't like a 40, a 20 mile per hour school limit. There are, are definitely avenues you can take before civil disobedience, but I think it's also important to look at the civil rights movement and understand civil disobedience was probably the best avenue to take because they weren't being respected in the government institutions. May I ask this question relating uh, uh, to voting and civic engagement? Should we have uh, compulsory voting like some other countries do? Why or why? Did you hear? Should we have compulsory voting? Go I ahead, John. Personally, argue no. I do not think compulsory voting would um, benefit the United States as many may seem. For instance, if you look at a country like Australia that has mandatory voting, you can see their democracy has had plenty of issues. They've almost had more prime ministers than they've had years in the past ten years. And you can see, and obviously, the people are continuing to vote for these people. And I don't think the American people would also like to be forced to vote. As you can see, most Americans don't even like to be told to stay home during a pandemic. I don't think many of them would react well to being told to force and go out and vote. I think our democracy thrives better when people who are actually engaged go out and want to be engaged and want to go out and vote. And I think that's more important in democracy than forcing the people to make decisions. Right. You are provided with the option and the right to vote, although not ultimately required, you are provided with the right and possibility to vote, but I don't think it should be required. Thank you very much. Excellent, uh, excellent work. Uh, and um, we, uh, we have some comments, some feedback uh, for you. And I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, begin. Uh, I thought that your prepared re remarks were spot on, clear, well organized, nailed the question, uh, you know, uh, had the historical examples con con coupled with the contemporary uh, examples, all great. Uh, and then in the follow-up uh, section, you also were able to demonstrate uh, a really a thorough knowledge of these issues and topics. Uh, I would have liked to have heard, uh, you know, just a touch more on the limits. You correctly point out those First Amendment rights being so important in terms of civic engagement. But all of those rights are limited, right? I mean, uh, we can't just say anything. Uh, we want to, uh, even in uh, even though political speech is the most uh, protected form of speech, it's still limited, and so um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing, uh, good job on the civil disobedience. You finally got around to the idea that it's it's a law that doesn't square with you know moral code or you know it's really an unjust law. It's got to it can't just be a run of the mill law. It's got to be a really uh, unjust law. And then the context also matters, that we tried to do something about it, couldn't. We tried to operate through the system and that didn't work. So excellent work. Thank you. I want to congratulate you. I thought you did a good, a very good job, answered the questions well, great presentation. You operated as a team. Well done. I also congratulate you for doing a good job. You're broad in terms of your coverage of th things. You were creative in terms of some of your some of your applica applications. So I think that uh, it was an excellent uh, uh, presentation. 